And everything just go away. <clears throat> uh, what do you mean? What do you what do you see right now? I see you and I see this meeting is being recorded. Okay. And do I guess I press continue. Do you see the image in the background? No, I see your cursor. Oh, okay. Stop that share. Just black, yeah. Every time I turn around, I feel like I'm messing up some some new thing in some new way. Well, it's part of how it goes. <laughs> it's kind of improv, improv humor. Right. How's the weather in LA? Very good. Mm -hmm. Very easy. Right now, today, very good. It was kind of cold, I have to say. I know it doesn't compare to Minnesota, but it was cold for us because we don't have all that winter protection. Mm -hmm. So it was cold a few days ago. I think we got up to maybe 40 degrees today. Oh, wow, that's hot. Melting. <laughs> that's it's melting. Celsius. No, not, not Celsius or centigrade. That's, that's Fahrenheit. Wow. Uh, so what does it, it's above zero, right? Above zero Celsius. Yes. Above, above 30. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 32 would be freezing in Fahrenheit. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. I am going to open the waiting room. You have five people in the waiting room already. Great. Yes. All right, everyone who's joining, you are all muted at the moment. You may hear Mona and me scratching and sniffling and getting everything ready here. Muted or muted? <laughs> you you should be you should be muted. Thank you. 
I'm going to mute you, Stuart. So George, this is later than you usually have the photo banters, right? It is, yes. I know. It's okay. We want to be we want to be hospitable to our friends on the West Coast. <laughs> and all of our friends on the East Coast, well, they all like to stay up late. That's my that's my contention. It's kind of true. Yep. Here in the Midwest, this is just about right. This is we're in the middle. Did you know I spent some time in St. Cloud? St. Cloud? Yeah, it's north of St. Paul. Oh, I know St. Cloud, yeah. Yeah. What, what did you do in St. Cloud? Uh, my, my father worked there for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to college at Ohio State. And I was visiting back and forth quite a bit. It was nice. Yeah. St. Cloud. Mm. It was gorgeous. What do you remember about it? The river, mm. the, the jet skis, <laughs> the snowmobiles. All of those things from, from college age. Did you participate? Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was nice because everyone was so outdoorsy. I never seen so many garages filled with toys. <laughs> Run up toys. And homes with really big windows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Yep. Always nice when you live on a lake to have uh, to have that view. And there are many, many lakes in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. I went, they invited me to, um, I don't know if it's customary or not. It felt very special to me. It was in the middle of the winter. There was a little lake where this group of people put a table on top, it was obviously frozen, put a table on top, and they put a chandelier in between the trees, and we had a dinner outside. Ooh, nice. With plenty of booze, of course. <laughs> was there was there aquavit and other? I think it was, I think it was aquavit and so on. I mean, I was new to, to the group, so I was just kind of observing, but it was so uh, magical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Get some uh, Christmas twinkle lights out there, and yeah, it was really nice. Hey, I'm remembering when when we were in North Carolina not all that long ago. There was some wonderful nighttime uh, scenery with uh, a fortune teller in a booth that was lit up by Christmas lights. I think that was at the place where you were staying. Yeah, well, it was um, Frank and Frank Conhouse and Ellen Cassidy's home, right. and they were one of the founders of Click, Click Festival. Right, right. And, and Frank, Frank was already a collector of my work from a long time ago. Um, and then he brought me over and he said, if, he, if I wanted to stay there, I already knew him for quite some time. So it was, mm -hmm. it's nicer to stay at someone's uh, house than a, you know, than a hotel. Well, they have, they have a lovely space in that house for, for residencies, don't they? Exactly. So it's really nice. It's kind of separated and you have your own, you know, your own area and it was uh, your own pod. <laughs> right. Well, Mona, it's great to have you here joining us for the 10th installment of the photo book banter. Um, my history with Mona predates our North Carolina experience by quite a number of years. Um, back in roughly 2007, I think we figured, or was it 2006? Um, Mona was in town in regards to, Chuck remembers, um, Mona was in town in regards to a, a, an event called Photo Bravo at um, the old Minnesota Center for Photography. And my favorite memory of, of that time, Mona, was, was a, some, some quality time in a bar just down the street from the center. Uh, called yeah. the Modern Cafe, and yeah. the Modern Cafe had a great big sailfish up on the wall above the bar. Do you remember that? Oh yes, of course I remember. It was great because, I mean, it feels like a different era, right? Because it was pre-pandemic. Everyone is just very casually after the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. We just kind of walked over everyone together and had a 
a nice time and a little bit more of a chit chat by the by the bar, more casual. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by the by the by the sailfish. I was thinking about the sailfish because that that's a really ham-handed segue. But I'm gonna say that you dove into a an in, an uh, a, a extraneous, insignificant, miscellaneous folder in the archives of our of our topic root or of our subject Rudolf Schindler. And yes. you merged with a ghost story. You emerged from that from the pool of the archives. Now tell us a little bit about Schindler and, and the archives that you spent all this time in and from which the book Monaco and King's Road is derived. Um, sort of a it's an it's it's a five year research project, wasn't it on your on your part? Yeah, it took it took quite some time. I um, ju- just a little background. I'm I'm now here in Los Angeles where I live, and um, at the time, maybe five six years ago, I spent some time in Vienna, and when I was in Vienna, I <clears throat> had one or another event at this museum called the Mac Museum, which is the Museum of Applied Arts and Architecture. And coincidentally, just how those things kind of happen, coincidentally, the director of that museum had spent some time and worked in New York for some time, had seen my exhibition in New York from the early work evidence. And when he knew that I was around, he called me in and said, hey, I know that you're around, I've seen your work, I have enjoyed certain aspects of your work related, you know, he, he had his own interpretation. He felt that he was a little bit more vulnerable and more, there was something about it that caught his attention. And he said, are you aware? So I know you live in Los Angeles. Are you aware that uh, about the Schindler house in West Hollywood? And I had been to the Schindler house before. It's now uh, a Mac center. So the Mac Museum in Vienna takes care of the Mac Center uh, here. And, uh, and the Schindler House was built by Rudolf Schindler, who was an Austrian architect that came to, uh, came to Los Angeles in 1910s, between 1910 and 1920, to work as a, as a young intern for Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd at the time was really busy with the Palace Hotel in Tokyo. So uh, Schindler very quickly grew up, grew in the, in the office of Frank Lloyd and, ver- and very quickly took on charge of larger projects. Right. Uh, he was one of his strongest pupil. Schindler, and- Schindler I, I mean, I had to look this up today just to get, his, to get his dates, but was born in Vienna in 1887 and died in Los Angeles at 53, I mean, in 1953. So he was not an old, he was about 63 when he died, not, a, yeah. not an old man. Yeah, no, he was young. And he, <clears throat> you know, at the time it was, by the time he came over here was right after, was between the wars, right? It was between World War I, World War II. He was an uh, Austrian immigrant. Um, he, at the time in Los Angeles is a moment where you did have a lot of Europeans and some even Eastern Europeans coming to LA. There was a, a bit of a hub, a social hub in this house that he built for himself. Um, and it was also at the time, a moment in history where uh, the house was observed by the FBI because they were too bohemian, because right. Uh, maybe the American government thought that they were all a little too bohemian and crazy, and maybe all communists. And this, so, and this is the house that that you ended up focusing on. This is the house that he yeah. built for himself, and and kind of his his yeah. gestalt, his his means of viewing the world. And um, so, he built it in what 1921? Is that right? He, he started building in 1920, and then he finished in 1922, which is exactly now 100 years. Okay. And he is the one because of this influence with Japan and Frank Lloyd coming back and forth, um, he was able to apply much lighter elements to the house. And it is considered among architects to be the first example of American mid-century modernism. So right now the house is a bit fragile, is a bit older, like the, you know, the the screens or the 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 these uh, panels that you just slide the door open. At the time they were with canvas, mm-hmm. um, 
So all of those that there's a, a, a certain fragility to the house. But when I visited the house for the first time, I also realized that he, he I saw a lot of things there that made me in a way very drawn to the house. As you know, I'm more of a figurative artist um, and I'm drawn to the body. I always felt that it's interesting that I'm inside my body. I cannot escape it. So I have made the body my theme for this life. So in a sense, when I entered the house, I saw things in the house that really made me think of that. Um, so for example, he poured concrete to create certain, to create the walls. It was the very first example of uh, ready-made uh, in, in architecture. Um, and, and so- Ready-made so because, they, because he, he poured the concrete on a flat surface and then lifted it? Exactly. So instead of putting bricks and creating a wall, he, he would create, uh, he would create uh, slabs that he would just bring as one big chunk of wall. Um, Mona, I'm having a hard time getting my slides up on this side. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if, if we can pull up some of the some of the house or the the, the photos file. Uh, hold on. Uh, what what image are you thinking about? Well, I, I'm just I was thinking a little bit about the um, uh, about the frontispiece images, but I I, I want to give people an idea of what of your details of the house because it's it's a hard house to see as a whole i think and especially in, in as as you've been pursuing the project it's been about zooming in really on details and and then having this story having this ghost story come out right and there's so here's a little bit of the sketch that he did uh, on his own um and you see that you know this whole ch this whole rectangle here is one piece of concrete that he created a wall with. And, um, and I mean, and, and there's these incredibly solid materials like concrete being used in this, but there's also, I love the fact that on the right-hand side and all throughout, we see these clouds and vapors and, you know, these, these levels of transparency and translucency um, right. that really characterize the house. And I think, I think you found a, an angle into the, into the material that that allows for those sort of ghostly, um, uh, vaporous uh, elements to to yeah to yeah. So hold on, let me just let me just come back for a second before <laughs> we get too deep. So what I saw, like in this poured concrete, for example, I would see where the concrete comes together, and it would create a certain wrinkle. Or he also used raw. Uh, like here in California, we have the redwood trees and he would use those slabs and you could see the vein of the, of the tree. So a lot of elements in it to me communicated um, an extension of the body. And I started becoming interested in this house, which is, there's no reason for me to be interested other than those hints where I started getting into it. And at some point I said, okay, so this director pointed me into this direction but I, I need to know more about everything that I photograph, I kind of need to know so I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I started researching a little bit at the, at the uh, um, Arts Design and Architecture Museum in the UC Santa Barbara, which is only an hour and a half north of here is one of the largest archives for architects in the US. And they just so happen to specialize with Southern California. So I was able to see everything that Schindler has done. And I think the next image maybe that we wanted, that George and I talked about was I started finding, let me share here with you guys. I started finding thing, cl clues of how I wanted to go about this project in looking at the archive. For example, this is, um, an image you see is a photo it, uh, from the archive. So this is an image of their bedroom uh, with the house would have this um, cement walls here and they were all bare. Like the cement walls were not painted. His idea at the time was to go against decorative measures mm -hmm. and just to have things as they are, um, like industry standard. Yeah, so, I was going to... Um, want to be sure to mention that that this house was designed for multiple families or multiple people, 
it wasn't just a single person. Um, it wasn't just a single family dwelling. Right. It was supposed to be for actually like two families coming together. It was one of the first houses that are nowadays it's so easy for us to imagine that but at that time it was the first house that had two two studios where people could be creative so it was not a bedroom it was not a living room but it was an actual creative studio so it was at the time very different the other thing that caught my attention is that this house was built as a body for example in our back we have the spine and that's where the strength is that's where all of the all of the parts of this house, all of the back walls are the cement wall and all of the walls in the front is exactly what you see here is glass and very open as if your soul is open to something more right. than just the firmness of your body. Right. So well, there's the spine was, and then, then there's your torso, your soft middle, middle parts. Yes. So in, in, in a sense, it became, a, it became one of the first houses in, in Southern California that had this in and out. So you would be in the house, but you would see all of the outside. Um, nowadays, we all have countertops and open environments. But at the time, this was the first example of what they call space architecture. So the idea of thinking about the space first and then building the architecture just to ever so slightly mold a dwelling around that space mm -hmm. so all of those things were things that i learned about the you know the um the architect and then uh, as i was learning more i ran into more and more uh, delicate materials so i wasn't really going into images of for example the blueprint uh the blue the architectural blueprint is something that number one has been shown this is an important house. So it has been shown all over. And number two, I didn't want to have anything that was uh, ready made for presentation. That right. was uh, that was an official document. I wanted all of the like the the image that we saw before, where you would have the doodling or or, or some images that he did for himself that maybe he never showed to others. Right. So a lot That's, more of the privacy of the materials. Right, because there were secrets. There were there were parts of the house that that reflected um, certain elements of his imagination, right? Um, and, and the important one of the important things about those about those concrete blocks is that they create louvers. Basically, they're they're like a gigantic uh, uh, shade, and the and the light passes through them, and that's where we start to get into some of the photographs and the idea of cameras and rooms. Right. And then in the middle of all this, uh, George, is, is it not is it not working? Should I continue showing the work? The... Yeah, if, if you would, please, that would be I good. have some, but I don't have all of those that we uh, put together because I would have to download them again. Right. But well, I can I can. Let's just wing it. Let's just wing it. Yes. So in the middle of all these archives, I found, so, you know, I was, to be honest, like, talking from a, a creative person to other creatives, I was in a way a bit lost, right? Because there was too much information. I am not an architect, but I was trying to find my way through and I was trying to find, carve my path through. And I then found this letter here, which was a letter signed by the architect. Rudy. Rudy, uh, but without, without a name. And the letter said, I'm just going to read the beginning. The letter said, your dreams will never, like so many, meet reality. Um, and then it kind of moves forward. The world is endlessly big and life rich without bottom. You will find your treasures without me, Rudy. Mm. So basically, it's a breakup letter without the name of the person, mm. which gave me, that was like, for me, that was the seed because for me, that gave me a, um, a chance to create this person, to imagine. That gave me also the impetus. I wanted to bring those two people that for whatever reason, I wanted to play Shakespeare, right? <laughs> so for whatever reason, these two people were desynchronized, right? The timing was off. I, I could tell from the letter and from a few others that were connected with this one that they were very special for each other, but for whatever reason, at the moment in time, they couldn't be together. Um, so I realized that in front of me, I had all this handwriting, I had his 
calligraphy. I had his pencil drawings. I had mm -hmm. the house as a remaining of who he was and his thoughts. And then I wanted to now create this woman to come and 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 visit him in in my own uh, in my own sense of reality, in my own work. Mm -hmm. So I started. Hold on, let me see here. So I. Uh, had a friend of mine that I had worked with uh, with before, and I started photographing her. So I took, I asked permission to photograph at the house, and I started photographing. So you see some of the architectural uh, elements of the house, but I also needed to, in a way, find find in my concept a way for her to cross the elements of time and space to see him. Right, so cross spatial architect just the space itself but also across the time and it daunted on me that when he built the house 1920s that's when you had the photo surrealists right um you were also interested in in the the, the woman's form right i mean that she resembled sheila models or or kokoshka or uh yes. other so i reached out to a friend of mine i had spent some time in vienna i was pretty much of uh, very comfortable and, and had studied a little bit the secession artists or Kokoschka or or Klimt or Egon Schiele and they all had a little bit of a certain type that was like a little bit more uh, a, a tall cheekbone and a certain green eye now this friend of mine is not Viennese she's Polish but she reminded me so much of some of that era Mm -hmm. uh, some of some of those drawings of the era um, and we started photographing let me see if I can open this one here so we started photographing with the elements of the architecture and her as well and to me what was really important is to create this idea that she is crossing in a way through solarization she's crossing the realm right mm -hmm. um, here's an image uh, from the cover of the book where you see that Partially, um, you still see the skin, the rendering of the skin, while the other part is kind of dematerialized. And you have the very famous Maki line, which is, you know, the oxidized silver that happens in the dark room. So all of these were done. So all the images of the, this mysterious woman, woman was done uh, with, in, in the dark room, with real dark room solarization. Mm -hmm. And then the images of the house I had uh, a more atmospheric kind of photography, not right. a standard, not a not a perfect architectural photography, but more the idea of of space and the emotion around that space. Um, hold on, and then I also work with those records of of time. So for me, it was interesting too, in that sense of having the solarization because. If you think about photography in 1920s or 18, it was still very much used as a document, right? It was like, okay, this happened, this is true. What I photographed in front of me happened. It was a document of time, it was a timestamp. Mm -hmm. And it was not until uh, the the it was not until the experimentation started with Man Ray and Lee Miller and Irving Blumenfeld, where the artists in Paris at the time, the painters. And the sculptors started coming over and saying, wait a second, what is this? It's completely random. You don't know if it's going to work out. Uh, there is an element, you know, it looks like you're yeah. sketch. Total, total candy for the surrealists, right? And the dots. Yes, yeah. So it was, if you think about it, that was the beginning of photography being recognized as not just a, a tool for recording something, but also as, as you know, you could, you could have a parallel in reality and it could be uh, used in a more artistic way. Mm -hmm. So that was the first, uh, in a way, time where you, it, it pushed that artistic pendulum uh, quite a bit in, the, in a different direction. Yeah. And the, and the house so beautifully segues into that. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, as I, as, I look at, as I look at the photographs, I, I more and more see earlier Mona Kuhn work, you know, this, this is not inconsistent. It's sort of like you've distilled it into two separate parts. And it really, I mean, there's the, let me see. Let me see. the yeah. Let me see if I can find here some of the images of the house. 
Yeah, I don't know what happened with my system here. I think it was a personal meltdown. You had a personal meltdown? Okay, I have some here to share. Hold on. So this is a little bit of as you enter the house, right? It was very much, you, you can tell right away this Japanese structure or certain references. Um, here is another image. You, 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 you have those slabs on, of concrete here, you see? Mm -hmm. And then this is actually a door. And this is, this is the fireplace, very raw. Everything in this house was very raw, was very, very minimal. The top of the fireplace is just copper as copper. And the wood beam is the wood beam as a wood beam. So everything was pretty much uh, what you would think. But I was also photographing these segments. And I was photographing this light entering the house and details of the house in different ways that were inspiring. And then at times, putting this person next to it, you know, incorporating the the person that I was photographing into some of those images. Uh, let me see here. This is also a good one. So there's a certain mystery to this house that we were uh, that 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 I was able to to work with and enhance some of the mysteriousness of the work of my visual vocabulary. And I was also able to include some of the archival material. So I received permission from the archives to have my own artistic in interpretation. So of course, this is an image of the envelope that was sent to the architect Schindler. Um, but some of the other material, like the letter, I, I was able to, to, to interpret and, and, and ha have enjoyed a freedom in doing that. Um, another thing that was really important for me was to have some images that, you know, at some point when you go back, back in the house and I didn't have the pressure of actually doing an architectural image of the house, I actually uh, saw a lot of the architectural photography that had been done in this house and I really tried to do something different. So a couple of things that I would do is play with reflections, which came from my previous series. I was always already looking for some peripheral vision of what's happening on the sides, what's happening, what is it that maybe no one else is paying attention, but I could uh, capture. And what's happening here is that I'm outside in the garden looking into the house. The house is darkened because there is no light, but the, you, the glass is reflecting the, 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 the garden behind me. And the slit is from in between those concrete slabs and create this, this, this white highlight. And that white highlight suddenly to me, it wasn't so much about what it actually is. It was about allowing yourself and your imagination to enter a little bit more of an occult or a little bit more of an unknown right. uh, form mm -hmm. of representation. So mm -hmm. I like to think of this as, as floating bodies or presences. Right. So, slowly as I was going back over and over into this house, it was becoming more and more ghostly. It was becoming more and more um, a certain omnipresence in, in, in the reflections or in the highlights of the sun entering the house. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see here. I mean, this one, this one strikes me, it's almost, it's almost filmic. There's like that, that sense of the sequential image in, in a, in a, in a moving picture. Right. Then oh. let me see if I can show you here. So this image, then we started working, you know, I created this whole series, let's just say one third, the, 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 the space. Remember, this is an architect known for the, one of the first architects to talk about space architecture. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to photograph his architecture, not physically there, but more spatially there. And, and, then if, and then one third of the work was uh, photographing this mysterious woman. And then another third was some uh, inclusion of the archive material. And then eventually I started turning that into the book. Mm -hmm. So in November of 2020, before we had the vaccine, 
I have dual citizenship, so I'm German and, and American. So I was able to fly to Germany to, to be with my publisher. And he said, oh, no Americans are coming and it's empty. And I was like, oh, no problem, I'll come over. <laughs> so um, it was also a bit of that eerie moment, right? Which in a way was kind of really interesting. And let me see well, if I have a, a few of the images here from the book. Right. So here you see some of that, some of the pages, like the, the everything that I wanted to include was hyper personal. So if it was going to be a blueprint, I didn't want it to be a blueprint, but I wanted it to have this like somewhat of a skin tonality to right. it. Right. You know, um, I, I'm eager to point out that this is a, this is your, not your first book from Steidl. Um, it is your most recent, but you had, you did a book back in 2004, right? Um, with Steidl, the early, your first book. Yes, I did the first in 2004. And then on average, uh, we were able to collaborate and do books every two to three years. So mm -hmm. this is the seventh book. Right. I cannot even believe it myself. <laughs> I mean, You're life is pretty to have to have bad. Books. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I uh... one of the one of the books you did was was very specifically about solarization. That uh, study book with TBW. Is part yeah. Of the... So so all, in total, I have done ten books. So I also had the pleasure to work with uh, TBW Books out of Oakland. We did a small uh, book, which was actually a compilation of four dif four different artists, and it right. sold as a as a set. Their subscription uh, series, right? Yes, and it's and, and it is uh, uh, those four artists did their own interpretation about the body. Uh, so I photographed a male <laughs> in the studio. Right, I thought that was very very daring of you. Well, yeah, we have to do things a little, you know, <laughs> a little differently. Um, now this one here, you see, there were some beautiful things happening in the dark room, where she would be in the shadow, but her body, you know, look at her hand, how real it is, like where mm -hmm. she's really. Of course, metaphorically speaking, crossing the element, right? Yeah. Um, and let me see here a few more. I, I, the, so, phrase, the phrase obscure object of desire comes floating into my head. Yes. Yes, there was, there was that. But I also wanted that idea, you know, maybe they never met. Maybe, maybe he had her in, in his thoughts while living his life, you know, in acceptance that they couldn't be together. Maybe... Maybe she was daydreaming about being there, even though she was never able to be there. So I wanted to, I wanted all of those angles to be part of the and, series. And you threw it back on Schindler himself at one point. You said about your dreams never being realized. Thought, well, Schindler at the time uh, was underappreciated. Uh, it was just after the 60s that there was a big comeback about him and a, and a wider appreciation. So I think that that letter when he wrote your dreams like so many may never come true the the reason why i fell in love for the letter itself is because i think that it was also self-referential hmm. so i think there was it was one of those things where there was so much i mean i always like uh to think that an image could could you know an image for me is really good if you can write an essay about it and i also use Use that philosophy when I was looking at the archive material. I was like, okay, is this just a note, or is this a note that we can, with an open end, that we can reinterpret in our own ways over a long period of time? Mm -hmm. Some of it because he was German, uh, sorry, uh, Austrian, and 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 using the German language. Some of some of the writings I kept in in German. We did not translate those writings because this is not a uh, scholar book in the sense of uh, looking at the material as documents is more about the, this parallel reality is more about a a lyric interpretation well you're you're, you're chasing a, a chimera um, exactly yeah exactly so it was also this element he was he was very much about being healthy sleeping outside uh, bringing nature, not separating nature from inside of the outside. So that translucency of the glass and was the, all about having nature with you. And, and you slept in nests, right? And they slept in nests. 
I don't know why I had this one here, but there it is, a signature page. <laughs> um, Mona's signa signatures are very colorful. Well, I like it. I like to be generous with it. When I buy books, I also like artists when they are generous. So I do the same. Um, but, you know, this just the positions were really interesting for me at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. I, uh, some of the solarizations, is, it was very hard for me to go back to the dark room and work uh, with the materials that we have nowadays. The papers have a lot less bromide. Uh, the chemicals are different. I consider myself... Uh, I started with black and white photography and I consider myself a, actually a really good printer. Um, I'm able to do, I don't know, I don't know, let's just say like 15 exhibition prints in one day. And uh, the first day that I was back in the darkroom to do the solarizations, I could not get one image out mm -hmm. that looked all right. Mm -hmm. The second day, I could not get one little strip that looked anything at all good. You almost want to like it, but it's a disaster. The third day, the same issue. I was really, I was, I was crying. I was on my knees. And then I took some break. I took some aspirin. I went to sleep. I didn't go back for two, three days. And then when I came back the fourth time, that's when it started working. Wow. Wow. It, it was a humbling process. It, it was like taking some kind of mind bending drug or something. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was having to reinterpret all of that. Um, so here you see some of these just the positions where I really wanted to, 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 I really wanted to welcome a little bit more of the metaphysical, you know, the light and uh, mm -hmm. the spirits of this house or the spirit, his own spirit. He was a very uh, bohemian person. He was very much into the arts. He was very much into uh, being open for self-expression. And I, I, I wanted to somehow capture that. Um, before we jump to questions, I thought it might be good to just spend a, a minute or two looking at the exhibition, the installation that you created uh, of the work from the Schindler House. Yeah, let me see here. I go really quick, a few more here. Um, there were some elements of it that were so beautiful. You know, of course, I was very much in love with all the work. I, I, I am in Los Angeles, so I'm able to go to the Getty and look at all the solarization that they have uh, uh, here. And I talked to Virginia Hackard, and it was, it was great. I mean, uh, some of it, you know, a lot of the surrealists, they, they had the hands. So I wanted to have my hands. So right. it, was, it was very playful in that sense. Um, and I had, instead of having a curator write, well, well, actually, I had two writers in the book. One was uh, Silvia Perea, the curator of the archives and the museum in Santa Barbara. And the second person was someone really special, um, David Dorenbaum, who is a, psycho, uh, um, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. Mm. So it was really interesting. The person that I was photographing, uh, she was finishing her PhD in psychology. So we had such fruitful conversations and it was really fun to, to bring that all into the text. Um, let me see what else I have here. Yeah, I, his, his essay I thought was very effective. Yes. It's it, very it, inspiring for me. Yeah, it, it was, it was it, I, with every series that I do, I try to do something different and this was really a, a, a real pleasure uh, to, to be able to incorporate uh, people that I haven't, uh, work with before and then in terms of the hold on let me take a look since we are winging it let me see some images here of the installation so a couple of things that I did not do hold on let me see if I can do this I need to reorganize myself hold on um some um, of the things some of the winging. things that I go ahead oh, I'm just saying we're winging it we're, yes, we're still we winging it. Yes, we are. So uh, maybe I start by showing, I was working with Sylvia, who was the curator there. Um, she came to me and she said, Mona, it would be so great for us to be able to do an exhibition um, and take a look at the museum and, and, and take a look at this very large main gallery in the museum. And I was like, oh my, this is very large. Um, and I was thinking to myself about, all the framed work and the large pieces and, and, and how to make sense of an exhibition. 
And at some point, as we were walking around, she stopped and I asked her, how do you do architectural exhibitions? I haven't actually been to architectural exhibitions. And she said, well, usually we put the blueprint on the wall, a little bit like photography. And then we have images of the breaking on the ground and the raising of the house and the construction and then some lifestyle. And she stopped and she said, well, I would really like to do something different than that. <laughs> and she's kind of sad. She was like, ah. and I looked at her and I said, oh, me too. Let's do something different. So over the course of two years with the material that I already had photographed, we started conceptualizing ways of showing architecture in a way that uses the space, not the walls, and we escape the frame material. So we push the boundaries of architecture, push, push the boundaries of photography, and escape the frame, and actually use the space itself of the room. Mm. So we uh, tested a, a couple of different materials, and we also wanted to be truthful to the architect about space architecture. We also wanted to be truthful to my idea of bringing someone that is crossing the, uh, the, the time and space. So we created three screens. Jerk me off. You good, Stuart? Bro, Stuart, bro, you good? Who? Jerk uh, me off. No, boy. Really? Yo, George, can you twerk on my dick? No. Oh, yeah, I guess we're being, uh, what is it that they slam you? or they Zoom bomb. You? You're being Zoom bombed. Oh. Yeah, we're being Zoom bombed. Zoom -bombed. Yo, Stuart, can you twerk for us really quick? Stuart, please, come on. Maybe you, John? Uh, I don't. Bro, I ain't sleeping on George, school. I don't have the... the I'm... I'm, I'm uh, they see the you of hot. cutting them off. Yo, George, you look like Walter they White. You, you, know? hot. you look like Walter White. Mm -hmm. Well, that was interesting. Um, if you individually would like to unmute yourselves, Mona, are you still there? Mona, are you with us? Oh, there you go. Okay. I need, and then you need to give us also the uh, enable the the video. Right. George, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I wish I that that did not happen. Um, I'm just trying to start the video. Am I still?
So, George, I think you yeah. need to give me um, I'll, uh, to, to give me the, the, the powers of starting my own video. Yep, I just made you the host. Oh, oh there, there I am. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around. I, I, this is the first time I got bombed. I was, you know, it's interesting. I was, so I, was immature. Warned, I was warned about it possibly happening. I'm like, oh, no, that's not going to happen. No, nothing ever happens like that. Yeah, I know. Well, I guess I guess it was happening with the kids, right? In school. Yeah. Any, any, anyway. Well, so yeah. I mean, so if if I mean one of the things I liked about the installation was that it really reflected the the construction of the house um, in its kind of an angularity and transparency. And it also reflected the book um, because of its ability to meld both the the architectural elements and the solarized portraits and your details of the house and the way the house looked and, and the way the house felt when you were inside of it. Yes, yeah, so you had those parallels. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm gonna share, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna share the screen here. And it's so here you see, uh, you see on the ground, you can tell that there is a screen here in a U shape. It goes all the way like this, but it has a certain distance from the actual wall of the museum so that, you, so that the viewer can walk around it. They can center in the front and then they can also walk around it. And so in that sense, the screen, they were like uh, theatrical screens that held the image really, really well. So you had a sharp, crisp, uh, retention of the image, but it also allowed it for a ghost image to be uh, on the on the walls behind. So I like to say that some of the images, uh, you see, here is a here is how uh, this was working. And the other thing is, at times I would use uh, I use uh, After Effects because I didn't want it to be a slideshow. So we did an entire animation, and everything is slow at times slowly moving at times changing mm -hmm. uh there was a score i work with a composer boris Alsho. he did an original 15 minute uh piece of music that was played in four different uh, loudspeakers so that he, at times he would be playing in different areas so there was the sound design as well to it mm -hmm. um I'm going to, I'm going to, Mona, just, I'm going to ask anyone who wants to unmute to ask a question. Uh, oh, yeah. Please, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please, just anyone, go. just go ahead. You, you, please interrupt me. I'm all happy. <laughs> but here you see those images that we saw on the uh, first as a print, then in the book, and how they translated into, into creating a space. So the projectors were mainly at the center of the room, pointing towards the screens so that the, so that the light would cross. And at times it would create this, you know, 3D, 3D elements to it. All of this is moving also. I, I will, in a way, uh, soon show uh, a piece. You see, here is the scale. The screens were 12 foot high. Uh, this is me and this is the curator standing next to it. This is a, one of the chair that Schindler designed. Um, you know, we were able to create the spaces uh, and at times, the screen was filled and then at times it felt very empty. So we wanted the, the space itself to expand and to contract. Um, and it was very interesting also for the archive, uh, for, the, for the archive to see their material coming to life in a, in a, you know, in a really large scale, in a cinematic projection of very small, uh, notes that you would carry in your pocket suddenly becoming such a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, here are the benches. And if you would sit right here, you would be looking at the from the inside of this U shaped screen. And I took this photo from the outside. So I can see the translucency of the screen immediately in front of me. I see the retained information, which is a piece of paper with his handwriting on the main center screen. And then I see the, the, the other, the, the left side screen with the image projected. And as you walk around, 
a lot of the feedback that I was getting is that people were saying, well, I become my own architect in this element, or I find my own angles as a, as a photographer. So this is an image of, this is the center screen, which is the largest, the widest. Mm -hmm. And this is the little corridor created in the back of this, uh, of this installation. So, so you, you put, have- her You put really big pictures on the wall in this case. You didn't put little pictures on the wall. No, well, the screens were 12 foot high, right? I know, I know. So, I, I was thinking of little tiny framed images that have now been expanded to- Yeah, I mean, the moment that I escaped the frame and the, and, and the photo being presented as a, 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 as a classic photography, uh, precious framed material, the moment that I escaped the frame, I might as well escape the scale, right? <laughs> so it was kind of like very, in a way, very, it gave me a sense of freedom uh, to really experiment and try something completely different and to see what this just the positions uh, create because your brain is always making associations. So it was really interesting to see the asso associations that were coming up with it. So this is, for example, the garden on the two sides and then the front. And then there's a little bit of the architecture here, just a hint of it. Mm -hmm. But you see the elements of this huge tree in, suddenly in the museum itself. So what do you, what do you, what was your biggest takeaway then from your experience with King's Road um, as, a, as a source for all of this discovery? Um, well, it's still, I mean, it's still giving, right? The, the, um, the exhibition runs until May 1st. Um, right now I'm learning a lot. We, we want it to travel. We have a few uh, collectors that are uh, sponsoring it. And everyone that has seen it has marveled at it. And they say, oh, this must travel. This must go beyond Santa Barbara, right? Because right now it's in a museum inside the University of Santa Barbara. And people really want us. OK, so here is a really interesting moment where it's what I like to say. It's not even a 3D. That's why I've been, instead of saying that it's a multimedia exhibition, it, how do you even define this? It, I, I've been calling it multidimensional. Mm -hmm. And and it's funny to see it at some times it's not even 3D, 6D, because we're projecting things on six different surfaces. Including, you know, this including the, the center, backs of the screens. Yeah. So the center, ex well, yeah, exactly. So the center unit, the V shape, and then here the walls of the museum itself that were painted uh, dark gray. And here is the blueprint. So instead of having the blueprint of the house into this, uh, you know, framed on the wall, we actually made it in a way where you can walk through it and you really get to see, you see here is like uh, signed by him, Rudolf Michael Schindler, Hollywood, California. This is his logo. Rudolf Schindler and the signature, architectural signature of the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So it has been really, really great. Um, this is when you enter, if you, would be, if you would be entering without seeing the side walls, it feels like it is, you know, the, the, the screens that we choose are translucent, but at the same time, they have this quality of retaining completely the, the, the image. Right. Um, so that was a positive from the pandemic years where we were able to experiment. <laughs> we had a lot of time to experiment with different materials. This is, I think you remember seeing some of the solarized images, which in a book, hold on, let me see if I can show you here. In a book, you would take maybe a, a one page, right? And uh, when I started, when we started projecting them, um, certain ideas would just come up and say, well, we could just make it a, 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 an entire spread. Why not? Um, so hold on. Of course, now I'm not finding that image. Hold on. Does the, does the video run from this, from this place? Yes. Yeah, I cannot find it. It's, um, but here, so let me show you here what it would do. And, 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 and turn on the volume in your laptops or in your computers because you, you, you'll be able to also hear a little bit of the, 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 the sound. It was composed with various things. It, we, it was an original score. So it had strings, it had piano, it had a Japanese flute. Mm -hmm. it, 
This is just a, a small segment. So the, the piece itself is 15 minutes. Uh, let me see here. I need to figure out how to get out of this. The piece itself is 15 minutes. There's various. Uh, let me show you this one here too. Hold on. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. This is another one that I like so much where you get this idea of, the, of how the, 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 the archival material mm -hmm. has been displayed. Here we go. Well, Mona, yeah, I think that that between your photography and the house itself and Schindler, all kinds of things flowed together. It was really a magical confluence, I think, of of skills and interests and capacities and just sort of a wonderful confluence, don't you think? Yes, and it was really interesting also for me to work with, um, for example, at the university, you know, collaborating with the curator, of course, is always a pleasure. Uh, someone that wanted to do something different. Me being in a moment in my career where I have done an experimental thing before that I, I'm like, okay, let's do this. I, 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 I would love that opportunity to do it. Um, and, and then also being able to work, collaborate with a composer, collaborate with a professor at the university that does stage design. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was also very incredible. I very early on, I realized I'm not sure if I can do, I, I don't want to do a slideshow. I want to create certain movement. Um, so I um, reached out, reached out to a student at, at UCLA that does animation, that does uh, after effect called Won Ho Lee. And he then suddenly start, became part of the project and we worked together and he taught me a lot how to make all those things. So it was, you know, a growing opportunity for sure. Right. I mean, and that's a that's a big evolution in, in your process. I mean, you your your black and white work was very just one on one, wasn't it? Yes. Now the you know capturing those images has always been one on one, uh, and it will remain that way. But it's really interesting for me to push it forward and to see where it goes, and also keep in mind, for example, during the pandemic. Um, a lot of conversations came up, well, what's the cost of something like this? Or, or how do we travel this? And it, it turns out that the audio and the animation, you can, you can just upload on WeTransfer to, you know, it's very pandemic proof. Pandemic. So, <laughs> it's, it's, so we, wanted, we wanted to streamline it. We wanted, we wanted to be practical. We wanted to be magical. We wanted to really use all of our uh, mature capacities Right. To, to really solve solve visual and problems. then and then the book the book offers the wonderful ability to take all of this confluence away with you and, yeah. and enjoy it you know in in your own time and space yeah and the book is amazing too like i like, like you mentioned i have had so many books and it is i'm very very beyond grateful for that but this book um all of the solarized images we had a, a little bit aside from uh, the various color separation. We had one extra pass of, of silver to them. 
it's very slightly because I didn't want it to look overly silverly. I didn't want it to look commercial, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but there is a certain path. There's a certain like classiness to the. To, well, you can you can see images. it on the on the outside. I mean, even I was noticing this in the afternoon light on my table. How the, the spine, the jacket itself, and the spine in particular has that beautiful silvery. Glow yeah. To it. Yeah, you know, I think at some point you realize you know how to do one or another thing. And so then you have to start doing more than one thing. Oh, yeah. Finding well, ways to make them all flow together. Yeah. So, Jordan, can yeah, we Chuck. ask a question? Go ahead, Chuck. Um, you know, in George's introduction, he talked about MCP and then going to this little restaurant on 13th Street. And I remember that evening and it was, it was delightful to chat with you, but I'm curious um, in many of the photographs, what in, in the photograph that we purchased and the books that I purchased of yours, much of your work is included within this architectural space with people. And so to see simple architectural spaces is kind of a shift, kind of reminds me of a little bit of Uda Barth and how elegant something very simple can be. Right, and I'm yeah. Wondering, yeah. I'm wondering how, how you got to that place. And by the way, the exhibit looks like it's amazing. So yeah, it, it, it's Just a good yeah, no, it's nice that you mentioned Uta Barth. She lives here in Los Angeles, and I and I know I I I, I have been familiar with her work, and I do enjoy that uh, simplicity and minimalism that she brings into her work, which I kind of attribute a little bit more to maybe like a more of a Japanese aesthetic. Um, mm -hmm. And I think and I think that 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 the house had the bareness, the simplicity of it, right? Um, I always knew that I did not want to photograph nudes in the in in a photo studio uh, now there's an exception here and there but I knew that that's not my relationship uh, to the nudes I wanted the nude to be authentic and legitimate I wanted to I wanted to be I wanted to find the nude where it's happening um, so early on I <clears throat> went in the, with the series evidence I had um, I had a chance to visit a naturist community in France and um, fell in love with it and was welcomed by the community and started photographing some of the people that I met there. Um, they, net, they were already naturally on a summer holiday. They didn't care. Um, of course, they also didn't want to have a photographer there when they're trying to uh, escape. Um, but slowly over time, I became part of the community as well. And I started photographing with their permission. So that was a place where I myself felt comfortable because we were in the nude and in nature. And there was a certain um, matrimonial relationship to your environment, to yourself and to your own presence and to your, the understanding of who you are within that universe. Did you say so, matrimonial relationship? Yeah, yeah. They use that terminology in French, and I like to bring it in English. Not always it, not always it combines, but ma making it where the um, where two parts come together. Oh, okay. maybe our presence and the and nature come together. Mm -hmm. Now in the U.S., I I also wanted to do works here, and I didn't really I. I went and, and saw a few naturist communities in, in California. I'm in California, so Northern California, you have that kind of stuff. But to be honest, it was quite different than what I expected and, I, and, and it wasn't my thing. Um, I am not, I just want to be by myself and enjoy it. I don't necessarily want uh, to be part of an agenda or a hippie community or everyone does this way or that way. I just kind of want, to me, Nudity is more about freedom, and I do whatever I want. So that's, to me, uh, uh, I didn't want to be part of a community. So in that sense. So right. I- Ping pong, ping pong at four, right? 
yeah, or, or, or don't do this or don't do that, or we all do this way, so you should do this way as well. I'm like, no. So to, to me, it felt restrained. And, but, but I uh, wanted to photograph in the US and I didn't want to always be in a, in a, in a nature's community, friends, like as a, as a human, as, as an artist, you want to evolve, you want to challenge yourself, you want to, you want to try different things. Right. And I uh, realized that to me, nudity is also very serene, is also very quiet, is calm, <laughs> is passive. And um, I started realizing more and more that that is what happens when you are at home or mm -hmm. when you are in your own thoughts, where you're not guarded, you're not at the artist atelier, you're not in the studio, you're not posing for everyone, you're going from the bathroom to your closet and, and you happen to be naked. And so, so I uh, felt that um, in, in some previous work that I did here at the Mojave Desert, where I photographed in a glass house, uh, that to me provided the safety that I needed together with the person that I photographed for us to work without worry. Mm -hmm. um, I also didn't want to be part of the pictorialists, right? right? So to me, it was more about the previous work, uh, She Disappeared Into Complete Silence, uh, photographed in a glass house with mirrors all around, was about um, refracting the figure, was about embracing some of the uh, history in Los Angeles of the 1960s light artists and see what is it that I can do with my own background with a figure, a little bit more of a French background and, and how can I bring that here? Uh, I, it was a little bit inspired by uh, maybe artists like Larry Bell uh, working with optics, working with uh, glass. Um, and then the Schindler house, uh, now, in hindsight, when I look at it, when you're doing it, you're, you know, as a creative, I think you're confused, you're trying to find your path. Uh, and, and I do enjoy the creative process. And I, I do enjoy the, the confusion and the chaos. I think that's very fertile. But in hindsight, I can look at it in a more organized way. And what I did with the glass house in the desert, which is a lot more golden tonalities, and you have the bright sunshine, it was more about refracting the figure within those glass material. Right. And then the Schindler, the, 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 photo, the King's Road was more about having the figure cross the element of time and space. So um, abstract from the abstraction. Yeah. So, but, but, but recently in 2020, I had uh, a bit of a retrospective book uh, with Thames and Hudson, which is of course way too early, but they convinced me because they said, it's not a retrospective, it's just a compilation of works done so far. So we went ahead with it, but um, in that, that, exactly, thank you. So in that book, um, I had time because it was the pandemic. I had time to think about everything that I have done. So, uh, until the moment I was always, I, I'm, I'm restless. There's a reason why I do photography. I am not gonna be a painter. I don't have the patience. I'm restless. I like it to be fast. and. And I like to be in a certain momentum. Uh, but with the pandemic and looking back in time, I realized that all of my nudes, although I work with nudes and although I consider myself a figurative artist, all of them, looking back in, his, in, in my works, all of them, I try to find ways that they're not just uh, blatantly there or gratuitously there. So I have measured how much I get to share with the outside world if it is selective focus, or if it is a glass reflections, or if it, or if it is solarization. Mm -hmm. It was interesting for me to see, looking back, that I tried to hide the nude right. as I was photographing the nude. You've always, you've always modulated access. You know, yeah. you've, you've controlled it, you've used devices to keep certain things private. I mean, you even have a book called Privacy or Private, you know. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, but you know, George, I think there's also a piece about, and I'm an architect, so I think about the word house and home, and I think those are different things. And I think that having people involved within a house becomes a home. You know, that's what you make of it. And what you've done with your uh, recent work, it's a house. And 
that doesn't lessen it at all. It makes it almost a little more elegant because you're showing the details. And I personally love that. Nice, nice observation, Chuck. That's great. Um, Mona, um, I know that we could continue on for hours, um, but you have uh, you have a glass of beer there that I know you have not been. Uh, I do have a glass of beer. Look at this. I have my glass of beer here. <laughs> and, and but it's a very Mona. tiny glass. Um, <laughs> but but um, I, you know, if anyone has questions, I mean, I'm here. Go ahead and ask well, them. Um, us... And also, and also, I wanted to tell you guys, if you guys uh, want a book signed, you can always order on my website. Right. Um, Mona, I think I'm going to stop the recording. So, okay. so you can really go off the record if you want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and oh, I, I can tell you a story. You know, <laughs> a lot of people, this came up uh, during the retrospective book as well. It's, it's really interesting when you do a retrospective, you kind of force, I mean, it could happen a couple of different ways, right? You do a retrospective because you have the opportunity with some publisher interested in it and you quickly repackage something and you put together and you send it out. So that is the one thing I did not want to do. And considering the forced uh, stop that the pandemic made everyone you know, get on our knees, basically. Uh, I really had a lot more time to look at a lot of material and re and learn from it, learn from my work, allow it to inform me. Um, you know, so many things I did, uh, I've been doing this for more than 20 years. So, so many things I did when I was so much younger and I honestly, I'm not sure if I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so, so it's really, there is a certain naive and intuitive thing about that that is very raw and interesting. Uh, but there is also something when you look back in time now over 50, when I look back in time, I was like, wow, all right. So this and that, it, you know, it could have been different. I could have chosen different images. Um, mm -hmm. But the one interesting thing about the, the book works was that I also had more time to work with the artists, uh, sorry, more time to work with the writers. So instead of having a weekend where we meet and quickly talk something and they, they write something, the writers in that book, we had months where we met over little coffee on Zoom sessions, which never happened before. Before I would have a writer of certain name that you, that you like to work with, and then they would quickly put something together. So, um, so all of that was very important. But the biggest thing for me was, to the, the question so often, although there was five writers there and so often they were asking why the nude, why the nude? And I remember a story I wanna share with you. I remember the story when I um, would visit my grandparents. So my first understanding of nudity, um, aside from my own body, aside from being a kid and you know being in the bathroom with your parents or whatever, um, aside from that, my own sense of nudity was when I, uh, I have German background, both my parents are German, but I was born and raised in Brazil. And on the, every other year we would go, my parents would send my sister and I to visit the grandparents back in Germany uh, during the summertime, which was a, uh, July or August. And in Germany it's continental weather. So it's very great. Like there's no summer, it doesn't happen. And, uh, other than once in a while. So once in a while, if the sun would come out and those rays would peek through the clouds, both my grandparents, who were in a way the age of Schindler, and that's why I also think that I felt mm. a, a certain connection, a kind, kindred spirit or so. But both my parents would completely undress, run to the backyard, lay down on their lounge, get a newspaper, and and absorb the sun because for them that was super healthy that was the one moment that they get vitamin d and they would look back at me inside the house and say mona mona come out here undress and come out here what are you waiting for so to me nudity always had an element of familiarity 
a backyard with my grandparents. Like it was, I wasn't introduced to nudity uh, as often as it is here in the US already on the sexual level. Um, to me, it was backyard with your family. It was about health. And it was about being healthy and capturing, uh, you know, getting your rosy cheeks. It was about, oh, I want to see you with some rosy cheeks. <laughs> You know, Mona, I, I, I hope that our photo or that our Zoom bombers um, uh, had a chance or will have a chance at some point in their life to- Well, no, I want, I want nothing to do with them. They were so <laughs> terrible. Oh, that was, well, thank you for bearing with us, with me and the whole oh, please, phenomenon. Oh, please, it's all fine. It's part of the territory. It is, it is. Well, Mona, thank you so much for- Yes, thank you. Us. Thank you, George, for having me. It has been a pleasure. And also knowing you for so long is, is, is really wonderful. Yeah, well, we'll stay in touch. I, I have a story idea that I'm going to run by you um, for Dura. publication later, later this year. And it's all about solarization. So. OK, sounds good. Keep me posted. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Yep, thanks for hanging out, guys. Uh, we'll see Stuart Rome next month. All right. Bye. Bye.